So I'm Bob Trug, and I'm the director of our Center for Bioethics here at the medical school. And I thought I'd give um, maybe just a little bit more orientation to what's happening here. Um, as uh, many of you know, we've done public ethics forums for years on a regular basis. And in a sense, this is one of those. Uh, but it's also more than that, in that uh, this year we started a master's degree program. And we have 22 full-time and part-time students. And one of the courses that is being offered is contemporary books in bioethics. Uh, and so as part of that, we're inviting four prominent authors uh, this semester to come and give a public forum, but also talk about uh, their, their book. And so uh, for those master students who are enrolled in this course, um, they've uh, had the opportunity to read Dan's book, In Search of the Good, from 2012. Uh, the class has already met for a couple of hours to discuss the book. We have the session this evening, and then tomorrow, Dan will be meeting with uh, the students again um, for a post-presentation discussion and further exploration uh, of the work. Just for curiosity, we, we, we have our uh, Fellows here, we've had a fellowship program since about 1990 under Millie Solomon, our new master's degree program. Maybe if you're a part of either of those programs, could you raise your hand and we could get, oh look, oh this is fabulous. And you know, so these are all people who are interested in really uh, acquiring a much greater depth of knowledge in the field of bioethics and we're very excited about that. To say a word about um, Dan, uh, the book In Search of the Good is a memoir. Um, and it really is a, an account of a career in bioethics. But it's really much more than a memoir because Dan's career really coincides with the field of bioethics as one of those who, who really founded the field. And uh, so in the book, he talks about really the whole range of ethical issues that the field has been concerned with for the past 50 years or so. And so when you read the book, you get to know a lot more about Dan, but you also get to learn quite a bit about bioethics. Um, Dan also spent some time talking about his experience at Harvard in a uh, somewhat less than positive way. <laughs> um, and I thought, I thought I would mention it. It's obviously no secret. Uh, but Dan got his PhD in philosophy at Harvard. And as he writes in the book, he was disillusioned by the total absence of interest in how we should shape and live our lives. And I thought that there was one uh, telling moment in the book where he describes uh, how a philosopher that he admired was criticized by somebody here at Harvard who commented that this person was a very good philosopher until he got interested in wisdom. And Dan quipped that no one on the Harvard faculty of my student error could have era could have been accused of that error. <laughs> and so without telling any of his mentors in the philosophy department, he went over to the divinity school to see if they had something better to offer. And here I thought his observation was also uh, very interesting. He wrote, I thought that the theologians had all the interesting questions about life, but no methodology of any great value in answering them. And that the philosophers had great methodologies to answer uninteresting questions. So you can imagine why Dan ended up leaving acad academia to found the Hastings Center. And he became really one of the most prominent secular thinkers in the field. And I liked his comment about wisdom and about the importance of wisdom. And he writes that, in his view, the idea of wisdom means taking account of the full range of human knowledge and experience, history, the physical and social sciences, religion, philosophy, literature, and cultural studies, among others. And I think that really is a, a wonderful summary of, of his approach to the field and also the success of his career. So, Dan, thank you uh, for coming. We're really looking forward to your reflections this evening about the past, present, and future of bioethics and, uh, and are so grateful that you were able to make the time and the effort to come and visit us. Good. So. Thank you very much. Yeah. This is actually the 50th anniversary of my PhD, uh, which seems like a long, long time ago. My wife and I just love coming back to Cambridge to remember what life was like in the old days, and it was a very much quieter 
place than is now the situation. At Har Harvard's a very busy place. Harvard Square has totally changed. Had one restaurant in our day, and that was it, where you took your parents when they came to visit. And now it's really blossomed. And of course, there was no such thing as bioethics, and not, not surely no interest or possibility of interest within the philosophy department. Um, I came to Harvard in great part because I had been a swimmer in college. I was on the Yale swimming team. I swam middle distance. Uh, all my teammates were breaking world records. Uh, I was not breaking world records. Uh, I was invited. I swam the Yale Harvard swimming meet uh, up here uh, in Hemingway Gym, I think. And there were 2,000 people showed up. Uh, and I swam the 420 yard, 440 swim was in yards in those days uh, and was asked to. Uh, uh, when, when I stood up at the block, you stand up and waiting, uh, and I was, they announced, my, and they announced my name, and everybody booed. Oh, and I said, hmm, what's going on? And, and anyway, I got started saying, after one hour, I said, they came here to be the, hear the, see the people breaking the world records, not me. They were booing the fact that they put me in, and I remember saying, oh, God, I'll show them. They came in last, so that. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I said that I learned by swimming with world-class people whom I could never, never beat up doing in anything that what it was like to lose. And it's a very good lesson to, to learn how to lose. And I really found what you have to do is you start competing against yourself. I couldn't beat any other people, so I had to, only could beat me. Uh, and I quit swimming because by the time I was my junior year, my times were going backwards. And I said, okay, well, what else is going on? And, and, college, and uh, so here we are. Uh, um, let me, the way I want to get it, the, the, today I'm going to give you my, this is a, my grandiose vision of the future of bioethics, sort of work, working up to it very gradually. Uh, break it down into very, various components and see if I, it's, it is, I, I don't have, totally have this totally straight in my own head, but uh, I will at least uh, make, see if I can make some sense of it in a way that will make sense to you. Uh, I think I'd want to talk firstly about different levels of analysis in bioethics, what I would call the philosophical and intellectual level, where you're really asking what, what, is it, what is bioethics as a discipline or a particular way of thinking about the world and healthcare. Uh, what, what, what do we mean by the field and what, what do we think is the scope of the field? Secondly, what is the uh, uh, sociological level? Namely, where, where does bioethics fit into the other forms of human knowledge and uh, p pursuit of, of wisdom, even if you will? Uh, what is our status? And, and uh, finally, what is, what is the place of bioethics in the world of uh, medicine and health policy? Now, I think each of those levels is important and rather different. And let me say a little bit about the uh, way we fit into the medical and policy world. Uh, and I think there, again, different levels. There's the, clinic, the, the clinical level, uh, where you really talk about patient care and doctor-patient relationships and things of that sort. The research level, where you try to think about the new medical technologies coming along, how to assess them, how to regulate them, how to think about them. Uh, and then finally, the, the level of uh, health policy, where you ask how ought we to organize the healthcare system in a way to serve the goals of medicine and to do so in a s sensible uh, and fair and affordable way. Uh, now, all of those, uh, uh, those are different levels. They inter interact with each other, of course, but, but I, I think all, most of us in the field usually pick one or the other. We specialize or are more interested in one rather than the other, but, but they all come together. And finally, uh, a question I found very interesting goes back to my philosophical days. What kind of a person should you be to do bioethics well? Now, I found there was no, the, the surest way of getting an argument going among my fellow philosopher students at my Harvard days was to say, do you have to be a good person to do, think about good ethics? The unanimous answer was absolutely not, no. 
thinking about ethics is, this is the day of analytic philosophy. To be good in ethics was to be, be smart, quick on your feet, very good with a counter-argument. It was very much an, a, a game of, uh, like chess, you're, you're moving around. The kind of person you are was absolutely irrelevant. You could be an absolute rat and have all sorts of wonderful good things to say. Uh, I think that may be true in some areas of, of, of medicine and healthcare, but by and large, I do think it matters what kind of a person you are. And they, so to me, what we have in philosophy called virtue ethics has been very fundamental. How can you think about ethics at all uh, unless you're also thinking about what it is to be a person li living a good life and fitting that in? Um, now, the overarching question which really grew on me as the years went on was uh, to really ask a, a very basic question as, about this, the whole enterprise of bioethics. But to ask questions about the enterprise of bioethics is ultimately to ask what in the world is uh, medicine and healthcare? Or what are they all about? Uh, how, do we, how should we understand the healthcare system? How should we understand the goals of medicine historically and uh, contemporarily, uh, and uh, what ought to be the goals of medicine. Uh, I've sometimes been called the father of bioethics, and, uh, and, I, and I thought, well, I'll, I'll play that line out a little bit and say, think of one as a father. First of all, you could have debates about, are you really the father? You know, a lot of other people, they, they think there's other claims that, that there are other, other fathers there, and have you really, can you really be sure about the, that particular background? Uh, and by, by and large, then the question is, what, what do you, who, who, are the, who, are, who are your siblings in this field? Who are you working with? How do you bring people together who work in this in the kind of collectivity like a family? And what should you aspire with, with the children in your family? Um, and so if, uh, from there, one, one can really have a sort of interesting uh, if you were a metaphor on thinking about a field and thinking about life, in, in short, how, how do you want your children to turn out? Uh, what kind of an atmosphere do you want to create for your children? Uh, what kind of outside influences ought you to watch out for when you're, as your children are going up and stop them from getting influenced by them? Well, all of that works pretty well in thinking about bioethics, as a matter of fact. Now, let me very quickly skim some other things which to build up on this picture. Let me say something about the bioethics as a field and as a discipline. First of all, most of you know the, uh, the long predecessor back, all, going all the way back to Hippocrates. But for the most part, uh, after the Greek era, uh, uh, ethics, uh, medical ethics was in the hands mainly of various religious groups. All of the religious traditions uh, thought about the ethical problems of, of health care, not of health care so much, but of, but of medicine. Uh, and it really was not until the uh, 1960s, I think, that the, the field, the, the more secular field of bioethics began to emerge. And that field emerged in great part because of the advances in medicine uh, during and after the Second World War. Unfortunately, large wars uh, do terrible, kill, and do t kill people and do terrible things to people. They also are a great way to generate lots of new knowledge. And of course, one of the great advances during and after the war was the development of the NIH in this country, which is a kind of symbol of all the commitment in this country to the whole medical uh, enterprise. Uh, and bioethics came along in great part uh, because of the no enormous developments, particularly technological. You had IVF, organ transplants, contraceptive pills, end-of-life care, shifting doctor-patient relationships, medicine as a, med as a market economy, a com commodity, genetic engineering, and, and all sorts of research, dilemmas of one kind or another, as well as the problems of human subject research. So you had a whole bunch of things suddenly coming into the pipeline, so to speak, or into, into the family system uh, very rapidly. And people began to say, my gosh, you know, these are raise, raising some interesting questions. Uh, and the Hastings, uh, idea of the Hastings Center, which I say, well, I think if we weren't the first in the field, there were various individuals interested, but we, we institutionalized the field. We created an institution, and that's the way we put it. Uh, it was uh, founded by a colleague of mine, Will, Willard Galen, a neighbor in Hastings on Hudson, New York, a psychiatrist, psychoanalyst, uh, and uh, he was just a, person who wrote few professional articles but wrote on every other possible social subject 
and it was the perfect partner for me. He was a natural hustler like me. We were both, uh, we, we had never raised any money, and we had to learn how to do that, much less start a, a center. Uh, we had to learn how to do that too, although we did discover at the time that the uh, early 70s and late 60s was a big time for starting think tanks all over the place. Somebody did a doctoral research in sociology on think tanks, and there was all, there we were. Uh, uh, as I say, you know, we thought we were doing something new. We were say, doing something new, as, as, like all the others were doing something new. Um, now, what was sort of interesting is when we began, uh, there really was a mixed reaction to the field. There were a number of people who were, I would say one of the main interests came from a group of scientists uh, in the uh, 1960s who really asked the question, where are, where, is the, where are all of these medical advances going to take us, in particular interested in the biological question and genetic possibilities. Uh, and it, it was not people from the humanities, much less religion or philosophy, but it came from a group of scientists who held a number of conferences, and I heard about those and got interested in uh, hung, it was hanging out at medical libraries, writing a book on abortion, began to see the issues myself, and that's why the idea c came along for me. Now, the, the reaction, though, among many within the field of medicine, at least, was, uh, uh, was suspicion. Uh, there was a nervousness that outsiders, that yes, the standard line was, yes, we have ethical problems within medicine, but we sure don't need people like philosophers and lawyers meddling uh, in, in, in medicine. Uh, and, and secondly, it was a time when many of the physicians were sort of uh, very much in, in the throes of behaviorism in psychology, uh, emotivism, for those who are philosophers, namely that ethics is nothing but the expression of emotions. That's about the end of it. So th there was no substance, no substance to feel. But, but in, in effect, uh, saying that, that there should be no, if there are ethical problems, there should be no outsiders. Fortunately, there were a number of scientists and others who thought you needed outsiders. These were public matters, and they needed a broad, wide discussion. And, and, uh, and it occurred to me over the years that ethics is a kind of odd field. We've, they've had something like six or seven national commissions on, on bioethics, most of which, uh, all of which have had only a minority of the participants are people with trained in ethics. Otherwise, they're just generally smart people from a variety of backgrounds. There being an assumption, which I think is quite correct, that anybody reasonably intelligent, willing to read and think, can, can make, have something useful to say about matters of ethics, in great part because we all have to make ethical decisions in our own life, and people can understand this. And in a peculiar way, uh, an awful lot of really good ethics comes down to, it seems to sort of good old common sense somebody's got to, knows how to sort of think straight as a really decent person trying to think things through, and then you can get a fair, fairly good number of people, of citizens together, and probably make some progress with these issues. Now, uh, it's very striking. Some of you may know the name of Steven Pinker, one of your more celebrated, notoriously celebrated Harvard faculty colleagues, uh, who wrote an article, a clop ed piece not so long ago in the Boston Globe, uh, saying ethicists get out of the way because a group of ethicists raised some questions about a debate in human subject research. And basically the story was this, the, this ethics crowd is just screwing up medicine and research and they should stop bothering us. I thought, well, that's wonderful. That's just like the old good old days. Uh, uh, anyway, and, uh, I, and interesting, at the same time, a very conservative woman, Sally Sattel, attacked bioethics. So we're getting it from the left, from Sinker, and this woman set tell from the right. I said, well, that, usually that's taken to be a pretty good sign. If everybody, if nobody likes you, it's probably they're probably doing something right. <laughs> um, uh, so, I would say the, the next fundamental question we had to think about is, what is indeed is bioethics, uh, and and what fields should have the dominance? Uh, uh, and there were a, a variety. Of, there were two main contenders early in the late in the sixties, early in the seventies. Uh, one was a number of People from them in, in medicine argued that medicine, medical ethics, it was called medical ethics, not bioethics, should be built on the traditions uh, of, of medicine itself. Uh, it, it should come from the substance of the work of, of the physician. Uh, the other view, when the philosophers began streaming in a little bit later in the 70s, was that but 
uh, bioethics should be built on the basis of, of moral philosophy as understood within the field of moral philosophy. Uh, and I would say early on that came to be the dominant theme. Uh, the great earliest struggle I had at the Hastings Center was that the philosophers, as they came in, were by and large of a, of a very secular kind. Uh, they by, uh, had no, many of them had no use whatever for religion or theologians, and I had to constantly say, but you know, some of those people in religion, they, they're actually pretty smart and have something useful to say, but a lot of them said, we don't want people like that, and I just had to override Red Conference, and I said, I, I'm going to have them. I run the place, and I'm going to have them, and that's <laughs> how they got, that's how they got invited. But I always found that uh, something, a mark against that attitude, since one really can never know where you're going to get some wisdom from what feels, but it's certainly there are a lot of the religion as much to say about these issues uh, as, as any secular issues. Uh, in any case, it was early on decided by us others that the field had to be interdisciplinary. No one field should be able to claim dominance. Uh, and the philosophers who said, this is our field, or the doctors who said, our field. No, uh, the very nature of the issues required a mixture of disciplines. Now, as I think all of you know, universities, uh, or a lot of people in universities love to talk about interdisciplinary work. Unfortunately, that's not the way universities are really run. You don't get your, you usually don't get your tenure from messing around in other people's fields. You get from being good in your own, in your own field and getting in the peer reviewed journals and the like. So this, as for all the talk about interdisciplinary stuff, there's not that much goes on. And, Again and again, our early days when we were in this very, we would have people come from universities and they were meeting physicians, meeting lawyers who were colleagues in their own university, but they never met. They said, yeah, people in the medical school, we don't talk to anybody in the law school for God's sake, but they would have a great time at our meetings just by virtue of, of that possibility. So, so it became, um, anyway, it became very interdisciplinary. Now, um, to me, the questions with increasingly began to emerge. There are a variety of very specific issues. I'll mention some of them later. But to me, the fundamental question that kept coming out more gradually over the years uh, uh, would be really asking three fundamental questions. What impact will the medical and scientific developments have on the role and meaning of medicine itself? Uh, in short, how are all these developments, particularly since the Second World War, going to change the way we, we practice medicine, we think about it, we pay for it, uh, and we make it part of our lives. Uh, secondly, what impact will these developments have on the way we think about health? Uh, I think there is a very interesting uh, obsession almost with health in our society these days. I'm sure a number of you read the New York Times. If you read the science section, the science section is now almost two-thirds health stuff. You get some physics once in a while, some chemistry, but it's more and more health. Uh, uh, and I, I, and I, I think that's, that's interesting, but also disturbing in a way, as in a funny sense, as health improves, we spend more money on it. You, at the same time, people get more and more obsessed, obsessed with it at the same time. In any case, uh, uh, to me, the interesting question is, uh, how, where do we want to put health? And where do we put health, medicine, and where do we put our own lives in this package together? Now, then one can move, I will next move what I call the layers of analysis. Um, now, I think one very common way bioethics is talked about is to talk about moral rules and principles. And those of you who are familiar with the field know about principalism, the idea that there are basically four principles, which is uh, autonomy or respect for persons, non-maleficence, uh, justice, uh, and do no harm. Uh, and those, those principles developed by philosophers have been very important in the field. Uh, I think they've been overdone. They've got a lot of problems. But, but everybody likes to think you, you need rules, you, you need principles, and that serves, serves to, they serve that purpose. Uh, but they, what's left out by principalism is, is A, it's excessively oriented toward autonomy on the one hand, and it has nothing about what I would call virtue ethics on the other. It doesn't ask what kind of a person ought you to be to, uh, if you're going to be an autonomous person making moral decisions, what kind of person should, should you be as a patient or if you're a physician trying to make a, a, 
a, a decision using the principles uh, of what kind of a person ought you to be in order to help someone else? At what, how should your autonomy be able to help somebody else's autonomy? Or, in which, or the cases where the issue fades over the patient needs not just autonomy, but the patient needs paternalism, and then how does that change the kind of person you might be if you have to be paternalistic on occasion? Uh, uh, I've been struck also, by, I say by the end of the 80s, that a very sharp division which had reflected itself earlier in the attitude toward the theologians in, in bioethics, uh, a very strong split. Our field is ideologically divided. It's by and large a liberal field. Um, the Hastings Center says we are nonpartisan, but anybody reading it for you know, three or four issues, will, our, our journal will say, you know, basically this is as like the New York Times you know, written up in bioethics talk uh, or something. Uh, it's not quite Hillary Clinton sort of thing, but you know. Um, and the interesting thing with big struggles with the conservatives, uh, because there are a number of, of obviously conservative, and by, by and large the big distinction, by and large the secular, the, 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 uh, the conservatives are, are more in the religious fold, but by and large, and they tend to be rather uh, uh, parochial, and they, they prefer to talk with each other rather than engage, I've found, in the major dialogues. You find them being rather separatists, even in the field of, of bioethics. And for the most part, they believe that the great Western traditions, uh, whether literature, history, religion, th that, that's where you find the answers to these large bioethics questions, not in issues and principles and rules and stuff of that sort. Anyway, that's been a kind of interesting struggle along the way over the years. So, Now, I, the question that it's all of the, I began think, trying to put all of these and deal with them day to day in the running of the center was really more and more of a concern is what exactly are the goals of medicine? What is this institution all about? Uh, and I began writing about this, I suppose, in the, in the 1980s. Uh, raise some money to have a project on the goals of medicine, brought in people from all over the world, uh, and had a great discussions, uh, did some publishing on the subject, uh, which, and it got published in five or six different languages, the study we did, a number of conferences in other countries, but practically no response in this country at all to that issue. Uh, because it seemed to me, I would want to say, what, what are we trying to do here? If you can't decide how you're going to handle treat patients or how you're going to treat research, unless you are pretty clear what you're trying to do, uh, and I found the assumption was, look, we know what we're supposed to do. It's really if you're talking about questions of means and ends, we all know what the ends are. We don't have to talk about that. Now it's just a question of how, how do you get to where you want to go. I said, well, you better know where you want to go and try to understand that. But I, I didn't get a response in this country, which was, which I found interesting, and so it's made me all the more. Um, this is pushing to get that question taken seriously. And I, I think if one asks what is the contemporary model of medicine uh, that uh, underlies the way we think about healthcare, patient care, clinical medicine, policy medicine, the, the present model would be, this may be oversimplified, A, death is the enemy. Uh, there ought always to be more and more research. Uh, there's uh, Things should always be better in our lives. Medicine can handle all problems, physical and psychological, and uh, and by and large, we uh, the modern medicine bought the Enlightenment model of the future, starting back in the 18th century, and it, it's embodied it almost perfectly. Let's always move forward. There's never, there's no stopping place, uh, and and particularly in the attitude toward death. Despite all the talk about end of life care and physicians and suicide and stopping, the enterprise as a whole doesn't like death and wants to do something about it. And it and shows no sign of stopping that at all. And that's where the, when the, you look at the research agenda, the research agenda is trying to find more ways to keep people alive, whereas the clinician is trying to find more ways to help, help people to die more peacefully. And these things are not always working in, the, in tandem at all. Uh, in any case, uh, and the thing that was drove me all the more to ask about the question of goals of medicine is that in, in my own interest in health policy, uh, I think it's well known in this country that we've had a, it's been a financial struggle. It's getting tougher and tougher as with an aging population to pay for health care. Uh, 
the projections down the road of the cost of health care are just astronomical in terms of percentage of GDP. And what's interesting is I spent a lot of time in Europe over the past 20 years, 30 years, uh, and at looking at other health. Every health care system in the world faces this problem. They're all having financial problems because all have bought into the model of constant progress. The problem is that constant progress costs a lot of money. Uh, and in a curious way, as we've gotten more and more successful in fighting off death, we're finding more and more, basically I put it this way, finding more and more ways to expensively keep very sick old people alive longer and longer. Uh, they may in the end go into hospice. They may in the end say no more, but before they, they, they get there, they can spend an awful lot of money. Uh, so what I began seeing that regardless of how health care systems are organized, uh, you can't solve the, the, their problem by a managerial solution only. Everybody thinks we just did. The Europeans, interestingly, when they're faced pressures, they say, maybe we should go to more of a market model, put it more in private hands. Now, of course, the other, in this country, we have want to take it out of private hands to make it public, but the, many of the Europeans look to the market to solve their problem. It doesn't solve their problem, it just as doesn't solve our problem. So the really uh, <coughs> end with the situation where I think the future of, of medicine itself as an enterprise uh, uh, needs to be called into question. And I finally wrote an article a couple of years ago where I uh, came up with an utterly utopian view of all of this, uh, which summed up a lot of what I've been saying here, uh, which I talked about the concept of a sustainable medicine. What we need for the future is sustainable medicine. Here, I borrow the concept from the environmental movement, and by sustainable medicine, I mean a medicine that is, A, affordable in the long run, uh, secondly, is uh, equitable, and, and uh, thirdly, uh, has good public participation and ex public acceptance and willingness to, to pay for it. Uh, and, and by and large, that means you need to come up with a notion of medicine itself, which has some built-in limits of one kind or another. What are the limits of this enterprise? And here, when it get into what I call the, para, the, the progress paradox, the, I've often used the model, I said, look, pursuit of, of, of better health is, is, the same, is almost the same as trying to explore outer space. No matter how far you go with outer space, you can still go further. There's just more and more out there. And I'm sure that if we got everybody living to be age 150, the doctors also would be, there'd be people say suffering, my God, can't you do something for me? Uh, that's the way it's going to be forever. Now, one might say, well, maybe there are some things in life that, that you, you will never basically win, but you just do the best you can for your time and, and, and move on, and so too with medical progress. Uh, I want to take the view that, yes, you can do that and say, yes, it'll be a lot of trouble having the progress, but we need it, we deserve it, people are getting sick, good. That you, everybody can think of bad cases, things we should spend more money on, and so forth and so on. And I said, no, we've got to find a way. I, said, I, I believe we have to find some way to find a limit. So here are some of my ingredients for finding a limit. Uh, first of all, devise a fresh concept of medical progress. What do we mean by progress? Is it really progress to keep a lot of old people indefinitely alive expensively or indefinitely alive? I'm very interested in the question of life extension. Uh, there are a lot of people out there putting in lots of money these days and to find radical ways to extend life. So, well, how, much, how long a life do you need to have in order to have a decent life? Uh, I once set the age of around 80. I'm now 85. I think 80 is pre pretty good. If you can make it to 80, uh, you'll probably have done most of the things you can do in a life and you ought to be satisfied. I reached 85. I, I'm still prepared to do so. But it would not, it might have been a loss to my family. My wife, of course, would be still weeping to this day if I died at 80, but, uh, but, but, but society would have said, well, oh, Callie, I remember him, he's a nice guy. He did something to do with bioethics, okay. What else is new? Well, that's, the way, that's the way life is, unfortunately. So in any case, the first, uh, so, we, so I, I want a model of progress, which is a limited model. And that's certainly what we're looking for with say, with the whole debate of global warming, how do we get people to set some limits to our desire to have continued economic growth? Can we have continued economic growth at the same time with, that we're not polluting our environment? And we have not figured out exactly how to do that one. But nonetheless, the model is there of, of looking for those limits and boundaries. 
So that's the, fir the first problem. Deal with what do you mean by progress itself? Uh, and, and ask that question. Everybody, time somebody comes along with a new scheme, we need money to work the brain, we need money to work on possible cancer, blah. Ask those questions. Uh, secondly, set research priorities. The National Institutes of Health spends a lot of money, comes up with a lot of money for research, so does the private sector. Uh, I would argue we need more money on, on for, for research on prevention, research on helping people who are sick put up and live with their illness, particularly the elderly who need more home care, put up lots of things that are not directly of a strictly medical kind, but, but are conducive to health. So you can, you, can, with, you can easily think of a different set of priorities than the prior one. Uh, thirdly, um, change health care delivery priorities. What do we want to pay for? How much do we think is, ought to be spent on the young versus how, or the old? And how should we deal with that question, putting together a Medicare program and setting the Medicare program against programs for uh, education, uh, childhood development of one kind or another, all sorts of uh, other social needs. Uh, <coughs> change the education and acculturation of physicians. <coughs> right now, I think the reality is the medical <coughs> school curriculum is heavily dominated by science. And, and the assumption has been that science is the way to really get people well and to fight the great good fight against death. Well, the question is, uh, how do you move back to, to a much better balance between caring for people and curing people? Uh, one of the great problems of end-of-life care is finding, finding physician, ways for a physician to learn how to deal with their dying patient and not see that just, just themselves as having failed because the patient is dying. How do we change industry incentives? Toughest thing of all. Unfortunately, people make a lot of money off health care in this country. Uh, how, do, how do we change that? Because we love, we love to make anything good can be turned into something bad when people uh, enter the arena and decide there's, there's, there's profit to be made there. And it's a good thing because why not? Uh, and I think one of the main things that happened to physicians with Medicare, particularly as Medicare began, was one of the things that began seeing helping physicians uh, income to rise uh, what was very, very simply a change in attitude is, well, I'm doing good and I ought to do well. That's a big, interesting distinction between doing good and doing well. But that the idea that why shouldn't I be well paid? And I, I began thinking about this because I would give lectures in the 1980s and over a period of time I'd usually be picked up by the chairman of some department. And I was the only, that was the way I got introduction introduced to every expensive car on the market. <laughs> the only one I didn't see with the Rolls Royce, but every other one. And I said, that's really interesting, interesting little trend. But, uh, but I found a very disturbing one. Uh, in any case, uh, what do we do about the market? That to me is one of the, is one of the big enemies. So I would end up finally, uh, uh, the need for healthcare system. I won't make the argument here. You're all familiar. I think you need a universal health care system. If we think national defense is, is good to preserve lives, well, health care systems are good to preserve lives, too. Uh, and I, I think our present system, the mixture of medicine and market, is, is basically a disaster. So in any case, we need to. And so that, that, those are my quote solutions. Now, how do you go about changing them? I'll leave that to you all, because I've gotten too old to do that kind of thing. But uh, you, I've given you the blueprint. Just go out there. <laughs> Just go out there and do it. Uh, do it. Okay, thank you. That's enough. Yeah. All right, well, thank you so much, uh, Dan. You've given us lots to think about and also to talk about, because we have some time to do that. Um, and lots of people that I'm sure will have many things to say. I'll go ahead and start as the moderator. Um, you talked about uh, inter interdisciplinary work, and I'd like you to uh, comment on whether bioethics actually is a discipline. Because as you brought up, the people who are attracted to bioethics often come from fields that uh, have a coherent methodology and a way of evaluating the quality of the work 
So if you're in moral philosophy, you know, two moral philosophers can look at each other's work and they can say, you know, this one's good, this one isn't so much. Same sociology, anthropology, you name it. And there's huge value of bringing people like that together. So is bioethics really just, you know, the Greek agora where we bring people with real disciplines to talk to each other? Or is it a discipline in itself? And if so, then how? Well, if you mean, mean by a discipline, uh, A, does it have a, a, a known methodology to which you are introduced when you come into the field? This is what you have to learn. If you have to learn to be a physician or a psychologist or a historian, there are certain things you have to learn in order to claim that you are, are one, or, one of those. No, we, we don't have, I don't think there is a method. And it's a bit like the old uh, saying in the, uh, what's bad pornography. I think those of in the field know, we, we know we know the good stuff and we see it though we can't tell you, we have no criteria we can show you as to just why it's good. So I think that if, if you think, uh, the, the problem is disciplines are narrow and, and the, the question is the issues are narrow, so you've got to have it work across disciplines even if you don't have a methodology. And it seems to me, the only, and, but it seems to me, let me put it this way, I guess partly I come in with a certain vision of what philosophy ought to be all about. Uh, and that is a, a tradition I draw from looking back the Harvard Philosophy Department in the late 19th, early 20th century, particularly with the time era of, of William James, Roy Santayana. Things were very striking in that era. First of all, the, the philosophers of those eras looked at every, just all fields, religion, culture, literature, history, it was, it was all just for the middle to be a philosopher. Secondly, they wrote for the general public and not for a professional audience. And there's a wonderful book called The Rise of American Philosophy, which is basically, it turns out to be a history of the Harvard Philosophy Department. And the history shows it beginning in that very broad way, particularly James went and moved back and forth between philosophy and psychology. Uh, but, but increasingly, as the 20th century came, it became narrower and narrower. So in the end, philosophers basically were ended up, as I found, analytic philosophy, talking to each other and, and making it a, a discipline. And the way you make it a discipline is you set rigorous criteria for what's counted as good stuff, uh, and then you make people, and you penalize them if they don't do that good stuff, and, and, and e.g., you don't let them advance in the profession. But, but it seems to me, uh, but even this question, even if you're asking a discipline, what's really good stuff in a discipline? Um, I'm fascinated by the question because I have a lot of literature in my own undergraduate background and reading. Uh, I asked the question, that, can you really have a good philosophy that only other philosophers can understand? If particularly if they're dealing with questions that, that are fundamental to human life and human values. If you have a field where you have to be specialized to even think about those matters, then we're all in trouble. So the very nature of the case, if we're raising questions that affect everybody's welfare, you have to have a discipline which is able, able to, A, make sense of everybody's welfare and communicate it to them. Uh, and and, and uh, now this, doesn't really answer your question, but that's the, that's the best we can do and the best I think we've come up over the years. Uh, you, you know, the, the people that I think have the most impact in any field are the ones that learn how to, uh, how to go effectively go public. Steven Pinker's a pretty good example of doing this. Uh, an awful lot of the leading figures, and many E.O. Wilson, are the ones that not only think well, but they're great writers too, and usually they're they're, they have some broad education they can bring to the way they talk about their own field. That's the kind of person thing. So I always tell if you want to do stuff in biology, read a lot of literature, read a lot of history, bring in as much as many, read stuff in biology, in bioethics literature, but read other things as well. Yeah. Good answer, thank you. Uh, other thoughts, comments, questions? Yeah, so we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to use this thing here, so. Okay. I apologize for that, but I hope I have my for thoughts. posterity, they'll be great. I hope I have my thoughts in order. So I, my name is Beth. I am a bioethics student at Union Graduate College. And I am a nurse, and I have a degree in anthropology. So I 
like to believe that I am well-rounded and I mm -hmm. study everything and I look at everything, but at heart, I'm a nurse. Mm -hmm. And I have found that medicine is not really interested in this mundane, let's change the system we have and, and uh, all arrive at sort of a mediocre mm -hmm. area we can live with. But nursing, in the historically, have been the people that go out and get it done. We mm -hmm. get done mm -hmm. what someone else has seen, what someone else's mm -hmm. vision is, and we are more about bringing it to the masses. Mm -hmm. Can you speak at all to the nurse's role in moving this agenda forward? Well, I think in the, I mean, nursing, the balance between caring, caring for people and curing people, that's the, uh, nurses are very much on the caring side and that's their great contribution. Uh, uh, I, I think it's a neglected field. The question is, it's, it's neglected in part because the gr great actions seem to be got with the doctors and the new technologies and the new ways to keep people alive long enough in the hospitals that the nurses can treat them, you know. That's the, uh, the nurses are the ones you take care of after the, after the big operations and, and the life-saving things that the nurse comes along to take care of the patient thereafter. So I, 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 I'm utterly sympathetic to the, your, your bias toward nursing. I think it's, it's absolutely important. And I wish that every physician would spend a better year or so being a nurse. Um, but th that ain't gonna happen. <laughs> um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on, um, about informed consent. Because <laughs> it's, it's changing and it's been mm -hmm. such an essential <laughs> concept within uh, bioethics over yeah. the years and it's kind of evolved yeah. kind of in real time now with biospecimens and big yeah, data yeah. and all. So I'd just love to hear your thoughts on that. Well, I'd say when the, uh, as the field of bioethics was beginning to emerge in the 1960s, the, 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 I would say the, the standard model of, of the doctor was the doctor, was the doctor, my colleague Will Galen said, you follow your doctor's orders and your patients and your lawyers your lawyer's suggestions and, you and your doctor's orders. It was a very nice, it was a doctor's decision to take the burden of decision making away from the patient because that was part of the problem. And uh, uh, you got a paternalistic medicine. So the, one of the major things that obviously began happening was as the profession itself was became criticized more, it was demystified, medicine was, then the idea that people should have a choice, autonomy came to the fore with the principles, and, uh, and and then I'd say after a while, autonomy became so. The joke got you know the doctor is just gives you a menu, and the doctor here's the menu, here are the choices you decide, patient. And I think as time is going on, I said, well, that really doesn't really work very well. Uh, now we're now I think there's a, a movement back to find a better balance between old-fashioned materialistic medicine, namely, where the physician one way or the other has to have some bad, what has to say what he or she thinks ought to be done, communicate this to the patient, understand some patients are not able to make their best, best judgments for themselves. And I think even more understand that we said patients, everybody should make their own choice, but most of us have no experience making a lot of the hard choices in life. It's not as if we've had a, you know, we've lived through 10 likely fatal illnesses, we've had to make decisions. Most of them were suddenly faced with a decision. We're not in a good position to decide what might be best for us. And here I think you need a physician, sometimes willing to be fairly pushy about it. And, uh, and uh, the, the question is, the old paternalism was bad, but the, uh, the new autonomy uberalis was not so great either. <laughs> and uh, that's the best I can say on that. But that takes a lot of, that's where the character thing is. How do you get a physician that's got the, the, you know, really how, knows how to think well about the welfare of a patient? Uh, uh, and I, 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 the whole theme I left out in this, I should have. Uh, I think it's very important for people working in bioethics to understand the culture at, from which they come. Uh, not only understand, know thyself, but know thy culture. Uh, and, and people making decisions about most things are, will, be, will reflect their class, income, education, all sorts, and you better know that about yourself, that that's part of it. If you're going to be a more paternalistic doctor, you better understand the difference between social, cultural difference between you and your patients and how that can be, and, and to what extent you're bringing some of your personal system values into something 
where they shouldn't be, in some places where they should be. If I remember correctly, at some time a while ago, you, uh, you said that, uh, used a metaphor for how we were handling ethical issues, mm -hmm. and the metaphor was we were putting uh, old wine into, uh, I mean, new wine into old wineskins. Mm -hmm. Are we still doing that, or have we come up with any new wineskins? Well, um, I, I, I guess my picture is that it's all become more complicated as time has gone. We've not, we have not settled, a lot of people really have, have adopted the four principles. That's probably been the leading system, if you will, that's been used in bioethics. But that's had its critics over the years. You now have feminist bioethics. You have people who have very specialized. That, uh, and uh, I, I, at the moment, if somebody asked me, what would be the dominant principles, values that are ethical or, or, or intellectual that are shaping the field? I think it's very hard to say because there's an awful lot of movement, people moving into different areas of, of medicine and healthcare, which weren't explored before. So you're getting, and people having to find new ways of talking about these issues. Uh, a lot of things that interest me, there aren't any very good ways to be. Uh, how do you talk about allocating resources between the young and the old? Well, okay, you say, well, it should be done justly. Well, how in the world, what, how do you decide what's a just solution to that sort of problem? Somebody once said to me, 90 years old, 90 days old, you treat everybody equally. And I said, well, the 90 minute old has to compete with an, on an even playing field with the 90 field. I said, well, that doesn't sound quite right. But trying to, what kind of principles do you bring to bear on that? I, I'm struck by the fact that the more difficult problems these days involve so many overlapping areas that it's very difficult to disentangle them to have any single, this is to come back to the question about, is it a discipline, any single known way that's the best way to deal with the problem. Uh, if it's a really serious problem and you're really sensitive, you ought to be as confused as hell. That's fine. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, Dan, <clears throat> you've been a leader in uh, probing the question of what's the purpose of medicine, mm -hmm. uh, what is health. Mm -hmm. We're meeting in the context of the ethics center here uh -huh. and you're meeting with students. What are your thoughts about the purpose of ethics education? Well, I guess what I consider good ethics education is to, um, well, let me ask in, in general, I mean, distinguishing from ethics education in, for work in healthcare versus the general education ethics. Well, let me leave aside the question of general. Uh, I, I, it seems to me what you want to do is to uh, equip somebody with a fairly rich view of life itself, drawing from a lot, lot of sources that you can bring to bear uh, in, the, in the making of this decisions. If, I'm sorry, yeah, that, that's, it's, that's the way I, I, I think essentially would sum it up. Uh, and your effort should be to open people's eyes, that old expression, to all sorts of different angles. And this is where the cultural comes in. When somebody says, well, I think we should do X, Y, Z, we'll say, wait a minute, uh, I, I decided after working about four years and five years in bioethics that if you told me your age, educational background, income level, I could predict 90% of every view you had in bioethics. And I asked, is it, wait a minute, it's supposed to be rationalistic. It can't be that simple. But unfortunately, that's the way, the way it is. Uh, uh, and uh, it's not surprising that a uh, lot more people are in favor of you know, Bernie Sanders in Vermont than they are in Mississippi. I mean, you've got to take account of that. that's part of life. Knowing all of that's going on, that you are, you can't escape your background. And, your and you had, how do you get people to understand that while well, working with very specific cases? But bring it, so that's, you know, and there, there you need to be widely read and think about things and get fussed, uh, distressed by things and uh, nothing else suffices. Am I answering your question? I'm not sure. It sounds to me as if you're describing education. I am describing education, that's right. Yeah, yeah. And how do you educate people to do this sort of thing? Well, and, and that's where I just believe. You, you give them lots of, lots of different things, ways, cases to think about. You give them lots of different ways of comparing different theories about all of this. You let them engage in argumentation back and forth, and that's the way it, you know, that's, that's the way it's done, it seems to me.
Um, hi, I'm, I'm one of the students in the master's program, and I, I read your book, and I liked it very much. Um, and you, one of the arguments you make a lot in the book and in your talk today is that to be a good bioethicist, you should probably read a lot of literature. How much science do you think you need to be a good bioethicist? You know, what would, what would you recommend in terms well, of... Well, I've had to deal with this. Let me, this is a little self-advertisement. I've had to, uh, I've just finished writing a, a book has, which on the face has nothing to do with bioethics at all. But it's, it's, just, it's a study of global warming, food shortages around the world, water shortages, obesity, and chronic illness. I picked them because all of them, those are five areas, I call them the five horses, they're all getting worse, not better. Uh, each one has a very important scientific component. I, my question was why, why are, of all the things happening, why, why are these five so impenetrable? Uh, they just don't seem to admit of solutions after 30, 40 years of billions of dollars spent. Uh, and uh, the, uh, uh, and, and I suppose, uh, I'm sorry I lost the thread here. Uh, how much science? Uh, how much science, yeah. In each case I had to learn a, a lot of science to do it. Uh, and, and it seems to be what you, uh, and I had, I used to say, people say, how do you, how do you deal with the science? I said, well, I can't deal with the science. What I have to do is, is read, just read a lot of it, try to understand sort of the bottom. I don't understand a lot of it, global warming science. How in the world do you, you d decide on projections in the future of what the level of carbon dioxide is going to be? I don't know. It's very complicated. You have to be very good. But you need to sort of be, understand the bottom line that, that of trust, what people you think are trustworthy, that you understand where they're coming from, that, that, that you get a good sense of whether they are well grounded in what they're saying, and you do that based on the consensus of other the agreement they've seen from other scientists, and uh, uh, that, that's probably the, that's the best you could do. You can't you can't compete in their own arena. That's I, I wouldn't dare argue with, with a, a given scientist about uh, any any issue in global warming because they they spend its whole careers on it. Uh, and, uh, so, uh, but I, I said the way you do bioethics well is. You have a, most of us will have a, a one professional discipline, and then we become very good amateurs in other disciplines we work on. I've written three or four books and things I knew nothing about. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, literally. No, I mean, I stu most people, I mean, this is, I, the way I had fun in my career was I looked for issues nobody else was particularly writing about. A, because there, then there was nothing to read. You didn't have to read a lot of stuff. Uh, and secondly, uh, just because it was just fun to, to and so I wrote a book on medicine and the market uh, some years ago. Nobody really tried to look at that one. Uh, I looked the whole question of the whole research enterprise and how we spend money and why we spend money on research. Uh, a variety of things that had not been written about before. In each case, I had to make use of the science. But but you sort of muddle through, and then you get I, I, other people to read that I write something. I send it to the scientists. Says, Does this pass? Well, it's a, can I write this and get away with it? And they said, no. <laughs> Just I did, when I wrote this uh, recent book, uh, I, was in, I was dealing with f at least seven different disciplines. In each case, I, I just would write out of the blue. I was, called, I was looking for good Samaritans. I would write to somebody who's a big food expert in London and say, dear son, so I really, really liked your book in London. Would you please read my manuscript? And, and nine out of 10 would say yes. There are some that didn't even bother answering. <laughs> but uh, because I would hate to, people ask me, to, would you mind reading manuscripts? You know, does any, nobody really loves that particular chore, but, uh, but they did and that helped. Uh, so after a while, you, you cover yourself, so to speak. And I must say, also, it's a kind of a cheating part of to all. Uh, I think it was cheating. Namely, with a lot of scientific stuff, you read the praise, the abstract, and you read the conclusion, and then you say, mm, okay, this is what this person thinks, and you use that, but you don't understand anything in between. You understand the methodology. <laughs> but if, if it's in a peer-reviewed journal, you could probably get away with it, because I can't understand the science, and, and I'm not going to go back to get a, a degree in it to understand it. It's boring anyway, so. <laughs> um. Thank you a lot for uh, coming over, and uh, I'm also in the master's class and read the book, and it was great. Um, and one of the questions that we had in our in our class was um, similar to what Amy mentioned. Uh, 
you are a man of, you know, you, you have your multiple feet in multiple disciplines uh-huh. uh, and are the father of bioethics, quote unquote. But do you think uh, it is as easy to be a Renaissance man uh, or a person uh-huh. who has uh-huh. expertise, even minimally so, uh-huh. in, in, a, in a vast array of disciplines, enough to have credibility in those different arenas or now in an era, is this era more specialized and, and it's well, difficult? I have this struggle with people, younger people in bioethics these days who have sort of bought the notion that you've got to, be, you've got to specialize. And I say, you don't have to specialize, partly because I've made a career of not specializing. And I, I, and I figured out how not to specialize and, and how to keep up with, with, keep up with things and uh, that, that you, can, you can learn and take on new things. And, and it's, it's death, and, it's, and again, it's, it's they keep doing the same old stuff. A lot of people make a whole career writing the same article almost, or book. Uh, uh, I think that's the way to have a tedious kind of life, and uh, who cares after a while anyway? So at least for your own career, you want to keep moving around uh, so that, that you, it, it keeps yourself stimulated to find new territory. And I think it's just easy. I said, look, if you can read and you learn how to do the kind of cheating I suggest you can get away with it. You can get away with an awful lot of stuff. <laughs> People are going to call me up, reporters, if my book is excessive on global warming. I said, oh my God, they're going to start. <laughs> because I think I'm an expert. Well, I, you know, I managed, I've probably managed to fake it pretty well. <laughs> Sorry, this is, doesn't sound very ethical, but. Um, <laughs> it's Hello, not, it's, if it's ba- bad ethics, it ain't the worst kind. Okay. Yes. My name is Juan Carmona. I'm also in the master's program. And I just wanted to return to the topic of biomedical research specifically. I'm a molecular scientist by training. Uh-huh. But I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts about personalized genetic medicine because it's something that's really, uh-huh. you know, being said a lot, there's a lot of hype and a lot of expectation. Yeah. But in light of the th- criticisms mm-hmm. and things that you've raised, what do you think is reasonable to expect? And what, mm-hmm. and how, what do you think might be also uh-huh. abuses and things that we should be looking yeah, out for? Uh-huh. Thank you. Well, actually, I think that uh, personalized medicine, precision medicine, they're sometimes calling it these days, uh, uh, I, I think it's one of the most interesting and menacing parts of medical research, uh, uh, partly because uh, you've got an awful lot of all sorts of new developments and ways to, genetic ways of prenatally d- diagnosing people. Uh, but, but we've never really asked, uh, we don't have a good way of asking for it to say, prenatal uh, diagnosis. Uh, it seems to be what a fundamental question that one needs to look into, but nobody looks into is, well, what does it mean to be a parent? What kind of a child, what do you want to, kind of a child do you want to be? Uh, people are worried they want to have healthy children and so forth. Well, the problem is you, there are a lot of people who have healthy children who get screwed up in life from all other things. That, 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 that you'll have no control of what your children, I think it was John F. Kennedy said, children are hostages to fortune. If you have children, by God, you can start it with the healthiest kids, the smartest kids in the world, and they can really ruin your life by messing up their own life. Uh, so I, I, and, and, and what's happening now is you're, you're finding ways to project what's going to happen years, decades later in people's lives. There's no, no good way to decide how to use that information uh, or, or to have people worried for the next 40 years that they may get you know, Alzheimer's at 85, for God's sakes. Uh, what's, the, what's the benefit there? Uh, and of course, the difficulty is you've got a lot of researchers <laughs> eager to find, keep working on it, to find more and more ways to make these projections and predictions. And you've got a lot of people who are gonna make a lot of money off of it. And that's the, then you've got the worst possible combination. But what if you, what if you had to imagine a situation where nobody could make any money off of personalized medicine? That would really, cool things down a lot, I think. Uh, 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 um, Dan, Dan really is a utopian. <laughs> um, I'm Alan Brandt. I'm no. a historian of medicine teach here. Former, former uh, st- intern at the Hastings Center, my exactly. God. Exactly. Former director of our center. Of center for, yes, and, uh, um, I met Dan when I was 25 years old. <laughs> and I've known him for over 40 years, <laughs> I guess, you know, I was thinking a little bit about what you said about mm-hmm. being the father of the field, and I'm prepared to make mm-hmm. the argument that you are, <laughs> and just how sort of, what, how, how many progeny you produced, <laughs> because, you know, when I first met you in the mm-hmm. mid-1970s, you know, the, 
whether bioethics is a discipline, it certainly wasn't yet a field. Yeah. There's just no question now that it's a thriving, crucial, global field. It's in every academic institution. There are many people who are professors of bioethics. Those positions, you know, in terms of the history of the academy, didn't exist uh, 40 years ago. And now we've watched its institutionalization. Um, mm -hmm. We've watched the development of major credentials mm -hmm. in our institutions, both mm -hmm. academic and hospitals. Oh. Um, as you pointed out, specialization, professionalization of the mm -hmm. field. Um, and, um, you know, it's just, it's sort of a remarkable story, mm -hmm. um, you know, that started at Hastings mm -hmm. on Hudson in many ways, oh. you know, now, you know, since the late 1960s. Mm -hmm. yeah. and so. In one sense, one of my questions is, I want you to sort of reflect on sort of the evolution of the field. We often don't get to, you know, control or determine how our children do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, that's one question. Then the second uh, question really focuses on what are you really saying about what our principles should be if mm -hmm. we want to work on yeah, these yeah, questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it seems to me, and I, you know, hope you'll agree with this, yeah. is that we have to continue to work on the most important, pressing, and difficult issues of our time. Right, right. And there are many different strategies for doing that, mm -hmm. and some will involve intensive specialization mm -hmm. to some degree. But at, whenever we do that, mm -hmm. we have to continue to relate that specialized work mm -hmm. um, to fundamental, crucial, and often uh -huh. irreducible and irresolvable, yeah, at least yeah, in the yeah. short term, problems. And I just want to say, you know, for me, that's what's characterized your career. Well, and, uh, I think that's, let me take two or three things. Uh, uh, I, I think for those of us who got first interested in the field, we were interested because of it. it did ask very fundamental questions about the, the nature of the human good and what health is and so forth and so on. Uh, and we saw it forcing people to ask, ask the deepest of human questions. Uh, and that's the way it got started. That's what a lot of the early scientists uh, wanted. Uh, and we did it. But then we came in, but then as this time went on, particularly, it's not because of the philosophers, but it was at least coincidental. Uh, the pressure was entire, uh, move away from the big issues to very concrete, practical, up-to-date policy issues. And of course, the foundations, don't pay for you to sit around and talk about the good life. They, they, like, they want to see what's the outcome and what value you have in that. And that sort of, I think, changed the nature of the field and made it easier to be, be more specialized. And that's where you got the money. And, and still, if you want to get money from NIH, you have to do that, do that sort of stuff. Uh, and I, I think that the trouble is, how do you, so we felt you always had to sneak in the big issues uh, along with the practical stuff. But you have to force yourself to keep pushing back on some of the deeper issues. So, uh, now, as the field has moved along, what struck me during the 1970s, I, I have a whole chapter in my memoir about the reactions, so the public reaction of the public and of the academic intellectual world. Uh, during our first decade, we got a huge amount of media attention. We were the new kid on the block. The issues were hot. Uh, we were in every possible magazine interviewed on TV uh, and then I, and then and, and during that during the 1970s we went from practically no medical schools with courses on medical ethics so by the end of the 70s almost every school and it was a, move, a very fast movement and then it, then it began plateauing off after a while when we got settled uh, and I think it began taking on the uh, trappings of a sort of an academic subdiscipline now we have urban studies, women's studies, black studies, you name it, there are a whole bunch of things on the periphery of academia which are also interdisciplinary. Uh, and, uh, uh, and I got particularly interested in, in what, what was our intellectual status. And what I major, majored, one of my measures was saying, well, how often do we get reviewed, our books get reviewed in the New York Times or the New York Review of Books or uh, in, in some of the broader, or the New Republic or the Nation. Uh, uh, and at first, we got an awful lot. Uh, I was reviewed three times in the New York Times over the years. Uh, there has not been a bioethics book reviewed in 25 years in the New York Times since then. Yeah. Thanks so much. I have 
I was hoping that you would flesh out a little bit um, your your thoughts about the the overall goals of medicine. And I have one particular mm -hmm. question about that, which is, I guess my my naive intuition would be that you know extending life uh, certainly not the be all and end all mm -hmm. uh, of, in terms of the goals of medicine, mm -hmm. but I guess it seems like a really important and really commendable goal, something that, you know, we as mm -hmm. uh, medical professionals mm -hmm. and as humans should be mm -hmm. really proud of and should mm -hmm. look to continue in the future. Not to say that we don't overdo it yeah. at times and that there aren't other goals and that perhaps, mm -hmm. um, you know, right now we're, we're in a, a very unbalanced mm -hmm state between mm -hmm. our ability to preserve life and preserve mm -hmm. function and quality of life, but it doesn't mean that preserving life is not a, a central goal of medicine. Well, I, I think you have to make uh, a, a lot of distinctions here. Saving life of, of, of young people, yes, obviously. Saving life of middle-aged middle adults who are responsible for running the society and raising families. My, my question arises, how far do you want to go in saving the life of the elderly? That's been an issue pre preoccupied me for years. And uh, it seems to me that uh, we don't need an indefinitely long life to have a good life. Uh, we can't afford an indefinitely long life. Our progress to date in, m m many of you remember the idea of compression of morbidity, a concept that was floating around being in the 1980s. What medicine would find a way to have a longer, a long life, which with people die very rapidly, you get very little illness and die rapidly. Well, interesting studies recently show that it's, it just is not happening. In fact, it's just the opposite way. People are living longer with morbidities than they used to in the past. Uh, so it seems to me we're up against some biological barriers here. And the question is, it gets more and more complicated to deal with those barriers. Yes, we can keep people alive. A lot of people live to be 100 and they've still cruising around, most aren't cruising around, they're in nursing homes in the 100, and they don't look too great when you see the pictures. Uh, and at that point, it seems to me, if you get people that far, you've done enough. You don't have to keep pushing on. The question is, where do you stop and put more resources and money that will help younger people rather than older people? Now, there's, there's a big complication there, namely, most of the things that help really old people are things developed often for young people that finds they work very well to keep very old people alive, too. That's uh, one of the downsides of trying to set some limits and boundaries. But, but, uh, but uh, uh, in, instead of thinking you're gonna deal with end of life problems just by counseling people about when to stop their treatment, uh, whereas the researchers are finding ways, more and more ways to uh, keep not pushing off that time of decision, I would say that's not helpful to make it harder and harder. And right, I think what's happened now is it, I think it's getting harder to make these end-of-life decisions because the technology is constantly advancing. The physician can always say, well, you know, we've really got something new. It's probably worth trying, and uh, uh, we're not sure it works, but you know, and the family has always hope. That's, uh, that's, I think that's the real tale of seduction there. Uh, so the question is, do you believe people are finite beings, or do you think they ought to be able to live forever if they want to? That's uh, <laughs> All right, well, why don't I take the uh, moderator's uh, prerogative here and ask the last question. Um, it's a little bit specific, but I think it gets to, uh, to some of the broader themes of your career as well. So uh, I know that the abortion issue was uh, one where you really kind of cut your teeth on a lot of this and have had some interesting disagreements with your wife over the years, and I'm sure lots of great conversations at the dinner table. Um, oh, no, abortion, and, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, as I, as, I, as I take your position, you're, you're, you're pro-choice, but it's not, it's not worshiping choice for the sake of choice, because there's, there's good choices and there's bad choices. And this is a little bit of a follow-up to Juan's question about the impact of genomics in our, in our world, because, you know, increasingly we are able to know more and more about uh, the fetus before, before birth. Uh, one of the dramatic uh, advances has been on the prenatal diagnosis of Down syndrome. And, uh, you know, increasingly available and accessible to most women. And um, we know that about, at least the, the estimates are, that about 90% of prenatal diagnoses of Down syndrome result in termination of pregnancy. Um, so, as somebody who is generally pro-choice but thinks there's better choices than others, how, how do you view this, this movement? Is it a, 
Is it a good thing that people are able to select against certain types of severe disability? Um, or is it a bad thing? And should we be offering these tests or not? Well, uh, I, I guess the question is, how do you, uh, I don't think you can stop people off, the researchers are going to come along, like it or not, and they're going to, they're going to do it. You're not going to stop the research. And, and once you, you, the research goes on, the research is going to get public. The public will hear about them and they'll want it. Some people will want it. And then I think the question is, uh, how do you begin educating parents to make these decisions and what should they think about? And that's where my reference to the fact that uh, you may have a perfectly healthy children who get later in life get messed up. Being a parent itself is a tricky business and just getting, I, I, when I, it, the era I grew up in, I knew lots of people, everybody had, a lot of people had Down syndrome. Now, they, they tended to be sort of stigmatized and they hid them, but they, people functioned well enough and they took them and they loved them and they dealt with them. Uh, uh, the, the Kennedy family had a very disturbed one of their, one of their children. Uh, so I know it's not the end of life to have a disaster. I mean, it certainly can be a disaster in a way, but people manage to transcend their disasters. So I think the question is, what, what kind of a parent do you want to be and how willing are you to put up with your, your child turning out not as you like once they're born? If you don't like, want a certain type of child, are you going to carry this all the way as they keep growing up? Are you going to hover over them and make sure, by God, they get into Harvard and, you know? <laughs> It's part of the same continuum, I think, unfortunately. So. All right. Well, uh, you've been I, I, wonderful. I think the question of what to do with things you can't stop is one of the, and you can't stop the researchers, and that's right. one of the, uh, this is a side issue. Uh, how, do you, how, do you, how do you deal with situations where things are in the pipeline of research, uh, but, but are still not out there in order to decide whether you want the research right. to go forward? Do you want to get make more and more things, the one out of a thousand, things that could happen to your child and make sure that one is dealt with too well. Right. Uh, that's, anyway. So how, how we direct the how kind we, of yeah, research no, no, towards no. the kinds of research that would actually exactly, enhance exactly, our lives rather right, than yeah, just, yeah, yeah, just yeah. gives us more choices. Right, 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 yep. You've been great. Thank Hour and a half up here, uh, been, uh, lots of questions. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. And thanks to everyone for, uh, for coming. <laughs>